Good afternoon. I'm Beth Skinner. I'm the director of the Iowa Department of Corrections. I want to thank you all who are here today and to all those across the state and country who have offered to our department so much support during this tragedy. The outpouring and support across our state and our nation has been truly overwhelming and we want to thank you. I call this event a tragedy because that is truly at the heart of what took place yesterday. Two wonderful people had their lives taken than while they're simply trying to do their jobs here in Anamosa. One, a nurse whose main mission was to help and heal our sick. One, an officer whose mission was to help keep this facility safe in order for men here to have a safe and rehabilitative environment. To have these two people taken from us in an act of senseless violence is nothing short of tragic. There are 3,416 employees among our prisons and our CBC districts, and every one of them has a heart that is hurting right now. And while we are grieving the loss of our staff right now, our commitment to our mission has not wavered. We are here to help make Iowa a safer place. That, ha that has not changed. While the details of this attack are still being uncovered and investigated by our partners in the DCI, who will soon speak to their role in this process, I want to make it clear about what took place here yesterday. Two public servants were taken from this world by an act that I only can describe as pure evil. Every day, the men and women of this department put on their uniforms and they enter these facilities where, while not, not common, have acts of violence do occur here when they work. Our brothers and sisters in law enforcement know what I mean when I say we take inherent risk in our work, so hopefully that Iowans can feel safer in their communities. Saying this does not make it easier to accept that these two amazing people are no longer with us today. Their families will never again feel the joy of their loved one coming home at the end of the day. The world is a little darker today than it was just a short time ago, as the lights of these selfless individuals were extinguished yesterday behind these walls. We have been in communication with their families, and for, out of respect for them, we tried to withhold the names of our fallen staff for at least 24 hours. Because their names will be made public, along with the charges being brought, I will share them with you now. Yesterday, we lost registered nurse Lorena Schulte. We lost also officer, correctional officer Robert McFarland. Nurse Schulte was a 50-year-old nurse with the Anamosa State Penitentiary. She served our agency as, and this facility since July 30th, 2007, and has faithfully served to keep our incarcerated individuals healthy since. Our hearts go out to the family that she leaves behind. Correctional Officer McFarland was a 46-year-old correctional officer here at Anamosa State Penitentiary. He served our agency in this facility since October 20th, 2008, and has faithfully served to keep the inmates and his brothers and sisters that wear the badge safe throughout his career. Our hearts go out to the wife and children he leaves behind. As for, those that, as for those that we believe were involved in this brutal attack on our team members, I will defer to the DCI to provide updates on the accused charges that will be brought against them as they conduct their investigation. They have made every resource available to ensure justice for these victims, families, and the department. I place full faith and confidence in our dedicated partners at DCI 
and the Department of Public Safety. It is my sincere belief that those involved in taking these lives will be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. As I conclude, I'd like to leave you with a parting request. Please keep the men and the women of Iowa Corrections in your thoughts. Say their names. Robert the, McFarland and Lorena Schulte. Those here at Anamosa as they deal with the loss of their team members, but all those that wear the badge that risk their jobs every day. I will now let Agent, in Special Agent in Charge, a Agent Ron on the DCI give an update on the investigation. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Richard, my last name is Ron, and I'm a Special Agent in Charge with the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation. Uh, we were called in to assist with this investigation yesterday and I'm here to try to bring you up to uh, date as to the investigation and what we have learned thus far. So on March 23rd at approximately 10:18 a.m., the Jones County Dispatch Center received a 911 call from uh, the, the facility behind me here. Essentially, they were told that three staff members had been injured and possibly four individuals were injured and they responded accordingly. When they arrived, they found correctional officer Robert McFarland had received uh, blunt force trauma to the back of his head. And also they had located Lorena Schulte within the facility as well. She too had received blunt force trauma to the back of the head. Also injured during this incident was inmate McKinley Roby. He also received blunt force trauma to the back of the head. Mr. Roby has been transported to the University of Iowa Hospital where he is being treated for those injuries and where he remains currently. There have been a number of uh, agencies involved in this investigation and uh, they have assisted with collecting facts and information as well as evidence at the scene. The investigation thus far has revealed this, that the two individuals who are responsible for this heinous act, Thomas Woodard and Michael Dutcher, they were attempting to escape the facility and essentially Mr. McFarland and Ms. Schulte inter interceded there, attempted to stop the escape and subsequently received the injuries that they did. Michael Dutcher is 28 years old. He was initially uh, committed to the facility here for robbery first degree, two counts, robbery second degree, ongoing criminal conduct, criminal network, prohibited acts, and he was sentenced to 50 years. His effective date here was on May 14, 2015, and anticipated release date would have been April 18, 2057. Thomas Woodard, age 39, was also here for robbery first degree and burglary first degree. His sentence was 25 years, an effective date would have been on January 13, 2017, and anticipated release date would have been March 10, 2029. The investigation is ongoing. We continue to interview individuals. We continue to collect as much evidence as we possibly can. I won't be able to provide all the information, but I can tell you this, that Mr. Dutcher, or Dutcher and Woodard attempted to escape by shattering glass in the break room within the infirmary. By doing so, that allowed them access to the bars and they then took a grinder and attempt to grind away the bars in hopes to being able to escape through the window. I can inform everyone here that they were not successful whatsoever in uh, making any success when grinding the bars down and there is no uh, concerns about escape in terms of them being able to climb out the window because they were completely unsuccessful in their attempts. Mr. McFarland was present within the break room when he was attacked with what appears to have been a hammer that was brought in with the two defendants. Ms. Schulte also was attacked with a hammer and received blunt force trauma to the back of her head uh, with a hammer. As this event was taking place, a staff member, Lori Mathias, 
attempted to assist and render aid to her fellow employees. And in doing so, she was grabbed by Ducher and Woodward was present during this time. Matthias was told that she would be next if she didn't cooperate and she was held against her will. After a period of time, uh, she was then released when Ducher ran out of the break room. He was witnessed running out of the break room by a number of uh, employees covered in blood and he was subsequently apprehended in an adjacent yard at the time. As previously mentioned, two hammers uh, were used in the assault. Those were located within the break room of the facility as was the, the grinder. Both individuals were interviewed by agents with the, the DCI. Woodard made admissions that placed him in the room at the time of the killing and witnesses identified Woodard as a person who attacked and killed Schulte. Dutcher made admissions that also placed him in the room and concerning his involvement in the deaths of both victims, including admitting responsibility for causing the deaths. This afternoon, both individuals have been formally charged. Both individuals have been charged with first degree murder, two counts, one count of attempted murder and one count of kidnapping second degree. If convicted, first degree murder carries a mandatory life and sentence without the possibility of parole. As I mentioned earlier, we are continuing to conduct interviews that is ongoing. The investigation is not complete. And if we are able to provide additional information, we certainly will do so when appropriate. The affidavit for Dutcher and Woodard will be posted on our website for access if you choose to download that, along with photographs of both defendants. So at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions if they have any. Well, this facility has a, a work program, and as part of that work program, like any other facility here within the state, there are tools that are accessible for them. And is that where the grinder came from, too? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Was it from Iowa Prison Industries, that work program, or other work within the facility? Within the facility. Okay. Not a, they're not members of ICI? Uh, I'm not aware of that, no, ma'am. They, they certainly are locked up and there's a process in place, but I'm not going to go into the details as to how that process is at this point. Are you looking at changing that process? That's beyond my purview. I'm here for the criminal investigation, and so I'm not here to speak to the administrative or to the policies and procedures for the, for the institution. Can we get the spelling of the victim's name? Sure. Lorena? I'm sorry? So Lorena is L-O-R-E-N-A, Schulte, S-C-H-U-L-T-E, Robert McFarland, R-O-B-E-R-T, McFarland, M-C, capital F-A-R-L-A-N-D. McKinley Roby is M-C, capital K-I-N-L-E-Y, Roby, R-O-B-Y. Michael Ducher is common spelling Michael Dutcher, D-U-T-C-H-E-R, Thomas Woodard, common spelling. W-O-O-D-A-R-D? -O -O yes, sir. And can you tell us how McKinley Roby was involved and what injuries he sure. sustained? Yeah, he, Roby again sustained uh, trauma to the back of his head, uh, very similar to our two decedents. And he actually, as we understand it, went to render aid to help out as much as he could and as a result, uh, sustained the injuries from our two defendants. What's his condition? I don't know. He's, he's currently being treated at the University of Iowa Hospital, but he's stable. Beyond that, I don't know what else his were condition the, is. Were the two perpetrators, would they have been required to sign off with a prison staff member saying, we returned these hammers, we returned this grinder, or is it, do they just put it in and lock it up themselves? Again, I'm not here to speak to the policies and procedures of the institution. Again, that's beyond my purview. Can that's to it? Yeah, after we get done with any other questions I might have. What were the job responsibilities of the inmates? I don't know that. I'm sorry. This might be a question for Beth, but when was the last time an officer was killed on the line of duty? Yeah, I'll, I'll leave that for Beth. Okay. Were the 
um, the staff members who were killed, were they, did, were they dead here on the scene or were they transported? Was there any aid that could be rendered? Well, certainly uh, staff immediately tried to render aid, life-saving aid, but they were unsuccessful. Uh, Ms. Schulte was pronounced here at the facility. Mr. McFarland was transported and while en route passed away to uh, the hospital. Do you know yet how long this uh, breakout attempt was planned? Was it a spur of the moment thing or had they planned it? It, it had been planned for some time. Uh, those details I'm not going to get into, but they, it, it had been planned by them for some time. Not that we're aware of, no. How were they allowed to be free moving and, and able to access the break room? Well, the break room was part of the infirmary, and so they made access or gained access into the break room once they got into the infirmary. And were they going with the idea of, under the guise of getting medical treatment? Under a ruse of uh, repairing some equipment. It was very short. It, it, it um, was not prolonged. Um, the exact amount of time is unknown, but we don't feel that it was a very prolonged event. Were they saying they were going to repair equipment in the break room or in the infirmary? All, right, all I can say is within that area. I'm not sure if it's break room or the infirmary at this point. Were they part of the crew that did repairs around the facility? I, I don't know. Okay. I don't have that information. Not at this point. We're certainly interviewing everybody that we can. Uh, if we do find that and believe that there are other people responsible for that, we will certainly pursue that. But at this point, everything that we have collected thus far indicates that Dutcher and Woodard are responsible for this. And with the crimes they were in uh, prison for, were they under, what level of security were they under? That would be a question for those behind me. Okay. Let me speak to that. Mr. Roby certainly uh, did everything he could to save those two. And I will tell you that both Ms. Schulte and McFarland are heroes. They're heroes. They did everything they could to help each other, but by their actions, they were able to save Ms. Matthias's life. So they need to be recognized for the, the things that they did at that, that point in time. They gave up their life and actually ended up saving another life. How did they do that? Well, as we understand it, Ms. Schulte tried to again render aid for Bob and vice versa, but there is a system in place to make uh, alarms, and I won't go into all that, uh, but uh, Bob did what he could to help both Schulte and Matthias. But uh, because of their actions, again, uh, Ms. Matthias was able to escape. So was uh, Ms. Matthias grabbed first and then they were attacked? No, she was, the other two were attacked first and then she was, she was grabbed and kidnapped. That would be the reason for the, the second degree kidnapping charge. The attempt of murder would be because of the uh, assault on Mr. Roby. That's all going to be part of the investigation. I won't be able to release that at this point in time. Well, if there are any other questions, I know you might have a couple more uh, for the director. But again, we appreciate uh, you coming out. And again, we will try to provide as much information as we can. The, the affidavit and photographs will be posted on our website if you want to download that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. I know there's a couple other questions that uh, we'll want to be addressed around more the administrative process. Um, the first one I remember off the top of my head was the last time something like this happened. Um, we did some digging um, and some research around when this has happened. Um, we're, 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 we roughly believe the last time this happened was in 1975, and it, it happened um, outside the prison. It was actually a staff member that was 
actually murdered in her house, but we're still looking into that deeper because of, of the records, because they're so old. But we are um, guessing the last time something like this happened of, of a staff member would be about 1975. And then there's another question about tool control. Yeah, as far as what were their job responsibilities and, and how did they have access to those tools? How is that monitored? Okay. I'm going to let Warden Larson, this is Warden Larson, then go ahead and respond to that. Okay. Yeah. Hello, I'm Jeremy Larson, the warden here. Um, we do have tool control policies and procedures in place, and so all tools obviously um, are checked in and checked out. And so part of that process, um, like uh, investigator uh, Rick was just talking about, is after any incident, we review the incident, how things happened, what went, how the process worked, how the policy and procedure was it followed, was it not? Um, we review all that, and so that's still in the process. So I don't have any details of where the uh, tools were checked out and all that stuff yet. We're still gathering that, and so. We will review all those things um, and review that. And, and Can you say what is the commonplace practice? Like, is it, what would, in a normal circumstance, what would have to happen? Do they have to clear it with one corrections officer and say, I put my tools back? Yeah, so, you know, we have, we have a couple, we have a maintenance area and we have our Iowa Prison Industries area, which have tools in those areas. And so anytime a, an incarcerated individual needs to check out a tool, they check out that tool and staff um, witness that, sign off on that, and then the tools, and then they check it back in and sign off as it, on it as well. So, what if it's a potentially dangerous tool? Does someone follow them throughout the whole time they are in possession of it? There's different levels of tools, and so our policy and procedure dictate that. Yeah. So if it's um, that's part of our policy and procedure. So if it's a real dangerous tool, then it has to be witnessed according to policy by staff at all times. A hammer and a grinder. Say, would they have been those are supervised tools. Were they supervised at the time of the incident? They were supervised by our staff that was taken back there, yes. By Officer so, McFarland? Yes. How many staff members were on duty during that time? Do you think there were more people there that have witnessed the incident happening? Uh, total numbers, uh, I, I didn't bring that top of my head, but we have, you know, we had uh, normal staffing yesterday, so. Um, what's, what's normal staff? Well, we actually can't share that information. That's 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 confidential information. Um, I will tell you. I'm sorry. Stuff in real quick. I'm sorry. Um, you know, one of the things when something like this very tragic happens that we do, as as the warden mentioned, is we do a very thorough evaluation and assessment of our policy, of our procedures, of our staffing, and you know, we do a staffing analysis. Um, you know, we have a lot of information yet to review. Um, this happened just a little over 24 hours ago. Um, and we will do our diligence um, in trying to understand all the different complexities of what happened here yesterday. But I do want to say, too, and I know there's a couple more questions, is that um, the Anamosa team here, the staff here, I've been here the last two days. I was here yesterday talking with staff, walking around, have been nothing but extraordinary. They have been strong. They have come together as a team. And of course, there's a lot of heartbreak, and a lot of sadness that we've lost our team members. And we feel hurt for their families and their friends and to our community. But I want you all to know in the community to know that we will do everything we can at the Iowa Department of Corrections to look into this and fully investigate and research all of our practices around um, this instance and I'm always looking to how we want to improve. Mr. Skinner, do you know whether they were part of the maintenance crew or the IPI? I believe they're part of the maintenance crew. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's all so yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you able to talk about the staff to inmate ratio? Is that something no, that you could talk about? Mm -hmm. it? Sorry, that's confidential. How does this impact the rest of the inmate population? Are you on lockdown? Yes, we are on, we are on lockdown restricted movement. Uh, and when we're on restricted movement or lockdown, um, is that basically uh, we are keeping individuals uh, or keeping the inmates in their cells while we do investigations. Uh, we still have a lot of things to look at. Um, and so we, we assess that uh, maybe once or twice a day uh, when it will be safe enough to open back up. Uh, but we're very thoughtful, methodical, and careful about that. Um, as we are conducting this investigation, uh, we want to get as much information as possible. So yes, 
a long, long uh, answered your question, but yes, we are on restricted movement. One more question. Did they have this bruise of, of repairing something in the break room? Was that an errand that they were directed to do by staff, or did they make that up? That's part. I mean, that's part of the DCI. That's part of the DCI investigation. I can't. And I don't know that for sure. I can't. So that's going to be part of the investigation. So because you said that a hammer and grinder are supervised tools, would it be fair to say that the staff were aware that they had the tools in possession at the time they did, just didn't know what they were going to use them for? I can't answer what what their their state of mind is at that point. We have to do further investigation on that. Again, I don't. I can't answer that question. I'm. I'm not. I don't know for sure how long they had the tools in their possession. Uh, my understanding, in terms of the tool checking in and out, people don't keep tools for days at a time. They have to check them back in. They have to be inventoried and things like that. But again, we're looking at all those things. I wish I had more answers for you right now. Again, it's something we're looking at very closely. Okay. Thanks, Director. Okay. Make it. One more. Give it. We're going to get a 